good afternoon or good morning or good night. Um, greetings, everybody. The difficulty I have in positioning the timing of the greeting is part of or connected to the theme of what I want to talk about a little bit today, which is on the screen. I hope you can see that the uh, dominant language constellations, a perspective on present day multilingualism, but specifically in relation to literacy in linguistically diverse societies. And the reason the greeting is difficult is because it requires negotiation because we are temporarily displaced. I'm in a different time zone, different part of the world from you. Um, and literacy practices have typically understood that interactants, the people interacting around the text are positioned uh, in a way that they don't need to negotiate those things. They have this, they share the same assumptions about where they are, the time zones they're located in, and so on. That's a small and possibly trivial way to begin. But I want to say that I'm very sorry that I can't be with you. I've been to Hamburg once and thought it was a beautiful place. It would have been lovely to be with you, but for um, family health reasons, unfortunately, I can't travel at the moment. So I wish you well in your conference and I congratulate everyone involved. So I can't move the screen. So let's see what's going on here. Um, yeah, there we are. So I want to thank um, you, especially uh, everyone who's there. I don't know how many you are or where you are. So this is another um, uh, erasure of assumptions or a scrambling of assumptions that might otherwise have been present in the past. Um, but I assume you're in a conference room somewhere in Hamburg or in, in the outskirts or somewhere lovely in a country villa, perhaps. Um, but I especially want to thank the Next Gen leadership team, uh, in Professors uh, Ingrid uh, Gogol and Ingrid Pillar, Sylvia Mielo Pfeiffer and Yong Yan Zhang Jeng, I'm sorry, um, for your inspired work and to thank you for the invitation and to Sarah McMonagall, a personal thanks as well for her assistance. Um, I want to say that my uh, input today is going to be around the dual nature of literacy, which is the primary focus of the next gen, of course, um, and the dominant language constellations, which might seem on the face of it not to be directly connected, but they are, and that's what I'll be developing um, in the course of this talk. So literacy has uh, a very complex nature in general, but these days has become vastly more complex than it ever was. The relationship between speech and the written transposition of speech, uh, speech being a, pr a primary human language modality, um, although not, not everyone agrees with that, but I think, I think it is true, um, was one of displacement, that um, uh, writing captured a language and then displaced it in, in time through the preservation um, beyond the uh, inscription uh, being made and potentially lasting for eons of time and possibly even forever. Um, so there was this dis temporal displacement between the production of a text spoken or written and its consumption when it was viewed or uh, absorbed by readers. Um, the scope of literacy as it is linked in its, uh, as it's understood and it's linked to policy and practice today, especially in educational settings and in multilingual settings, um, educational and non-educational uh, is really a large part of what I'm going to be talking about. And I'm particularly interested as a policy uh, specialist uh, in the link between how we understand forms of literacy and multilingual literacy and public policy. And I understand public policy to include more than just what governments decide, but obviously that's central, but also what a school might decide or a university might decide, or frankly, 
I think it's um, acceptable and viable to, for people to talk about lecturers and teachers um, involved in policy. And I see policy as a discursive process of negotiation of what will be done in a certain environment. So I take a very wide ranging view of policy. Um, literacy in the latter part of the 20th century, but especially from the 1970s onward, uh, was subjected to really radical reconstruction of its basic forms in the United States uh, with the work of Shirley Bryce Heath and others, very radical centering of literacy around social relationships. In uh, other areas, the work of Brian Street in Iran and a few other places and other scholars in the UK and in Europe, um, and then in Australia, radically re-emphasizing or emphasizing really for the first time, social settings and the social construction of what counts as literacy and how uh, it ought to be taught. So very radically remade to the extent that this is now a widely accepted set of new ways to regard literacy. There's a report from the World Bank just a, a year and a half ago, um, which basically uh, goes some way to accepting social uh, understandings of literacy, which uh, differentiated them from uh, cognitive, principally cognitive ones. Um, and these are now becoming quite widely accepted. It's very clear within UNESCO's understandings of literacy that the social uh, reconstruction of literacy has been very successful. In the most general sense, therefore, as you can see, their literacy is now frequently conceived as a social practice and not just a skill or a, or a cognitive practice um, or a, a form of cognition. Uh, even to conceptualize literacy itself as a skill, however, is complex because it is, uh, uh, it is produced and consumed and negotiated in multiple ways. And even UNESCO, and as I said, to some extent, the World Bank have expanded their sense of what counts to be literate. And being literate and literacy, of course, are extensions of the same thing, but not the same thing themselves. And of course, we know literacy, these are really obvious parameters, I suppose, to begin with. Um, literacy is embedded in the construction of disciplines in institutions. Um, it's very clear in schools, for example, the way a geography teacher imparts what counts as geography involves not just the teaching of the subject matter of geography, but literate practices for the expression of geographic knowledge. And so whether they regard themselves as literacy teachers or not, uh, geography teachers do teach literacy that's particular to the disciplines. And a lot of that work derives from the thinking and research of Michael Halliday and Rakaya Hassan, uh, who were at the University of Sydney for many years. So these sociocultural approaches to literacy are really important today. Uh, social orientation to literacy, as you can see on this text, I hope is um, based on the claim that literacy varies. I mean, it's not possible to imagine something social without centering the, the inevitability and the assumption of variation. If you have something which is social, obviously the interactance will differ from setting to setting and therefore what counts as their interaction will change. So once you insert a social dimension into something, you insert dynamism and change and variation. And uh, also in Brian Street's work from the um, uh, uh, 1980s onwards, the whole idea of the meaning and purposes of literacy activities derived from cultural processes as well. So these sociocultural approaches to literacy reflect intellectual shifts, as I've shown, but also ideological ones, because people are attached for different uh, ideological principles to one or other definition of what counts as literacy. Different things flow in public policy from how you define literacy. If you take a principally cognitive one, uh, approach to literacy, you will afford or favor discussions that might lead to some kinds of testing, some kinds of monitoring, some kinds of teacher education, and not others, and or backgrounding them, and so on. And in Australia, where I live and work, these questions are very important in schools. I'm going to uh, 
refer in the second part of um, this talk to a paper I recently wrote on the title Reconceptualising Literacy for a New Australia, which looks at uh, the concession of educators that we must all make in this country to Indigenous multilingualism, Indigenous literacy and semiotic practices, and how these radically change what would count as literacy for everyone. Um, and part of the moral reason for doing this is because historically, literacy has been a cultural construct that has been used against certain populations in social conflict by regarding some populations as pre-literate or non-literate, it, it has actually uh, enabled uh, oppressive practices towards them by people who regarded themselves as more literate and more civilized than them. So literacy has these moral, political, pedagogical consequences, depending on how we define it and understand it. So the order of things in the world is impacted by what we regard literacy to be the assumptions we work with. Today, it's more uh, multifaceted, less predictable, and more reliant on negotiation and interpersonal interaction. Uh, we can't infer as much about an interlocutor from literacy as we used to be able to. In uh, less pluralistic societies, literacy was an indicator of some things. These days, it's an indicator of less. In fact, if you look at how the United Nations organizations have worked and UNESCO in particular, which in the late 1940s was charged with like a global agenda for literacy in the world, we can see that um, the way they talked about literacy at the time and the way they do now is really radically different to a significant degree. They imagined that literacy would occur within particular and homogenous national groupings that the literacy practices would reflect the culture from which it came in a, in a kind of one-to-one -one way, and that there would be less negotiation about it. And uh, uh, as I say, uh, it's very instructive to think about how UNESCO as a single organization with a global mission has itself radically changed how it's looked at this over, over time. So we all have learned. So there are all these complex relationships between literacy society, political and policy questions, linguistic questions, which I won't be able to go into, and historical realities. So a social perspective embraces these questions, but also critical theory. Um, if you think about empowerment and opportunity, and we understand how important literacy is in literacy saturated societies, and we believe that, and we can show, and there's empirical evidence uh, of course, from the World Bank and many organizations, and we know this as educators, that students who achieve higher functioning forms of literacy have um, uh, uh, benefits that they are able to deploy in society uh, that advantage them in, in jobs and in other ways in positioning themselves um, that uh, uh, critical scholars have paid a lot of attention to and therefore literacy is connected to relations of power in this way and it challenges teachers to think about this. Um, this new wave of thinking about literacy has been called new literacy studies. James G's got a definition of it here. There are many, I've only se selected one, um, that in new literacy studies, literacy seen as something that people did not do inside their heads, but inside society. Therefore, it's not primarily a mental phenomenon, but a sociocultural one. And that ways of participating in social and I should add economic and cultural groups is, is influenced by how we regard this. Therefore, we talk about literacies rather than a single singular uh, transposable and transferable literacy that's once gained is available everywhere. I worked in adult literacy studies in Australia, and one of the interesting things in advocating this to government over time was how often people assumed that if people, adults, were not functionally literate in English, the dominant language and official language in Australia, they're not formally official, um, then this was the fault of primary school teachers who had failed to teach them properly. When we looked at the statistics very closely, we found that 
that um, despite the skepticism we had with what the politicians had said, we found that in fact, the many people who uh, were uh, as adults not functioning literate had actually done very well in school literacy. And so the relationship between what happened in school and adult life was very complicated and quite different from this one-to-one -one transfer. It's to do with what's expected of you in literacy, how it's mediated by technology, what social practices involved, and whether or not someone who leaves schooling moves into a literate environment in which they're expected to continually use written forms of language, uh, et cetera. And so this meant that this idea that it was a failure of school teachers was actually quite wrong. Um, uh, one model that um, I use and that forms part of the paper that uh, comes from that I'm going to refer to uh, in a few moments it comes from uh, Bill Green, Professor Bill Green here, who looks at literacy. He's looked at many, many uh, models of uh, literacy, and he discerned that there are three basic dimensions. He called them the operational dimension. Um, you know, uh, which is everything to do with pedagogical questions in relation to literacy, none of which are unimportant. Uh, no critical approach to literacy should neglect how important good teaching is and good uh, imparting of literacy is and how some practices work well and others do not. I mean, I'm, I'm not in any way diminishing the operational dimension. That's really important. The cultural dimension, which of course is about the meanings of literacy, in different traditions, in different societies. And we know this when you think about religious texts and the way in which um, the content of religious texts is negotiated by the readers or inheritors of that literacy text, we can see that there's very strong cultural dimensions, but it's not just true of um, faith, of course, but all across the board, there's a cultural ideological dimension to everything. And then the critical one, how literacy is connected to power and um, uh, views and beliefs that are embedded in texts. So producing uh, readers and writers who are not only just consumers of knowledge and extractors of knowledge from text, but capable of critiquing them and writing productively as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about this one particularly because it's too complicated here, but one of the ones that we use a lot in pedagogy in Australia is the four resources model, which comes from the work of uh, uh, Alan Luke and Peter Freebody, um, uh, which again, like uh, uh, Bill Green's model, looks at um, these different processes. And in their case, code breaking, you know, literacy is encoded uh, language and that we must uh, understand how encoding happens and then decoding it or breaking the code to extract messages from it. Um, practices of turning learners into uh, uh, users of these texts, um, analysts of these texts and participants in them. So this is a useful one that we use in the training of uh, teachers here. I don't know how widespread uh, a, a knowledge of this is in, in Europe. Um, and here you see a cameo from uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, cathedral in Florence. It's now in the museum, Museo dell'Opera della, um, uh, in, in Florence, um, which, and this is my photograph of it from 2017 by Luca della Robbia. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but just before I do, I want you to uh, study this image and see uh, all the ways in which the classical uh, um, notions of what counts as literacy are embedded in here. But also if we look at the semiotics that the sculptor uses, I think we can find some critical to, and to use Bill Green's um, uh, uh, model, operational and cultural aspects of it too. Here we have basically, I'll uh, uh, describe this more carefully here, it's called La Grammatica by Luca della Robbia and it's in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo, it's terracotta, it's a cameo depicting a tutorial, an idealized tutorial and it was sculpted, I suppose uh, that's the verb you use for um, terracotta, sculpted in um, 1437. 
And it's a time actually where Florence, more than any other part of Europe and probably almost anywhere in the world, had a really high percentage of children, including girls, going to school, although in this cameo they're both boys, um, both mathematical schools and uh, grammar schools. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I look at that a little bit in this paper that I'm going to refer, to refer to. The two boys, one of them is clearly a reader and another one is a writer. I'll let you see that yourself. Some, one of them is reading and has his right leg elevated and the other one is looking at the teacher um, and the teacher... Uh, look at the motion of his hands from the book or the parchment to in with his right hand to his left hand and then to an open door behind him, which is the classical door of the academy, promising the riches that result from becoming literate. So we see a lot of messages that are expressed in the way this works um, uh, as a piece of art. So and and the, the teacher depicted here is Priscian, the uh, sixth century grammarian born in North Africa <clears throat> and he's the author of the Institutes of Grammar which was for many centuries Europe's authoritative text for how to teach Latin and uh, his main principle one which actually you find still very prominent in public education uh, around the world is the idea of the exemplar we find uh, texts of unimpeachable quality of high excellence regarded that way by uh, other people's judgment, presumably that become part of the literary canon. And then um, uh, you extract the exemplars, the, the bits of the text that express the high quality of this text most perfectly. And then you teach them explicitly for the learners to emulate. So they basically copy uh, these mentally and they reproduce them and emulate them in that way. And this was the method that became the pedagogical principle at the medieval universities in Bologna, um, the first one, and then in Paris and all across Europe eventually. And in other language traditions around the world, we find similar kinds of pr principles of canonical texts and authoritative literacy and exemplars that e express these uh, principles perfectly and then they're meant to be uh, uh, emulated. Now the interesting thing about this and the reason I use it is because uh, I was living and working in Florence at the time for a, a UNICEF has its International Research Institute in Florence and I'd been working in Myanmar in Southeast Asia and I went to there to write up the outcome of my work which I did last year, I finished last year and um, I hosted some friends, uh, international colleagues at a conference, and I said to them, there's this interesting depiction from the 15th century of what literacy is, and three colleagues decided to accompany me. And as we looked at it, one of our colleagues, and she was from Malawi, made a very interesting observation. She said, there's probably a big difference, isn't there, between the languages the boys would have spoken at home and the language that Priscian is using to teach them. They wouldn't have been speakers of Latin. And of course, she was right about that. And then went on to say, of course, that is the reality for millions of children in the post-colonial global South. So this really incisive, interesting remark from our colleague. And the local Florentine teacher um, or academic um, said, oh, yes, that's true. It's also true for immigrants, actually, some of them, many of them for Africa, in fact, uh, who some of them presumably from Malawi, exactly in working class schools surrounding uh, Florence today. So what we have is this remarkable movement and displacement of people today. And so this literacy is not only different in intellectual terms uh, in the way I was saying before, but radically different in terms of who learners are and what their learning backgrounds are. And another student made the uh, uh, observer academic made the observation that the door was closing rather than opening and it was closing for the student who wasn't paying attention. Um, I discussed that in in my paper at length, the difference between these things, but I won't be able to elaborate them now, but just to say that even an ancient um, image like that is interpretable in culturally very radically different ways, depending on the lived experience of the observer. Now here we have two maps of Australia. 
Now, on the right, I'm assuming it's on the right for you, but the conventional one, which is the uh, the uh, colonial Australian map, which is the depiction uh, of of the of the federated Australia from 1901 onwards, with its uh, uh, six states and two territories, and then the map that no one knows. Um, which is the map uh, no one knows outside of Australia, but is the map that existed really in the minds of people, in the knowledge of people for nearly 50,000, possibly more years, the map of indigenous languages of Australia and how these define territory. And what we see here is what we might call a geo body. When we think of a map, you think of the map of Germany, you have a geography, it has a body and you imagine it with certain kinds of meanings that we project onto it. Just like literacy has historically been relatively uninterrogated until recent times, so too have maps, which actually are a reflection in our mind's eye of what we bring to them. I'd love to be able to talk about that for two hours, but I'm going to have to move on. Um, and the reason this becomes relevant is because today we have staggering mobility of populations. One of the people whose work on this I find most compelling is Thomas Nail, who is a US philosopher who looks at uh, population mobility in deeply philosophical terms in what he calls kinopolitics, mobility at the center of new human identifications and transience. He doesn't talk about education, but I use some of his ideas to extend them into education. And this takes us to the sense, I'm sure this is deeply true of anyone teaching students in Frankfurt, of uh, diasporas, uh, people living in one community physically, attaching themselves mentally and emotionally and intellectually to communities around the world. Um, I've uh, recently done some work on this in relation to the Italian diaspora, but it's true of all diasporic movements and diasporic identities. And we must complicate this with international students. So any literacy we teach anywhere these days in societies as complex as ours have become involve forms of negotiation that take all these kinds of things together. So how does all this, and I'm needing to rush a little bit now, forgive me. How does all this connect to the dominant language constellation and what is the dominant language constellation? Well, what I've been describing is the growth of multilingualism. And the growth of multilingualism can be understood in many ways. In fact, in a recent article uh, just a couple of years ago, Professor Stephen May said that multilingualism is the topic du jour of um, sociology and sociolinguistics, that everyone's talking about multilingualism and they name it in different kinds of ways. One of the ways that people name multilingualism is to continually pluralize it, to look at continually um, uh, devising ways to describe all the languages or all the repertoires. Some scholars even dissolve languages altogether and deconstruct them so that there are no boundaries between them, etc. So there are many, many different ways to look at language, uh, to look at multilingualism in societies. And this is a very big challenge to societies that are defined around singular languages, um, and uh, known as official languages with their official literacies. Well, one of the things that we know um, is very important here, of course, is that public policy cannot deal with this level of complexity. And so I was very attracted to the notion of uh, the dominant language constellation, which was devised by Professor Larissa Aronin from Oranim College in Israel and her colleagues. And I, uh, and I met uh, uh, her and we agreed to work together on a few things. And in 2020, we wrote a book called The Dominant Language Constellation. And she's, sorry, we edited a book uh, on that and she's since um, uh, carried through another two. And I believe Sylvia is present and she was editor of one of these with, uh, with Larissa. So it's a depiction of multilingualism which, as I said, is a near ubiquitous condition of the contemporary world, an autonomous part of the whole system of multilingualism. And it was attractive to me because as a language planner, a language policy person, I could see that it had much more traction with the way in which officials think about multilingualism, 
they regard it as a problem mostly, but they still want, don't want to think of hundreds of languages that they might have to do something about, and neither do teachers. Um, but when we go and look at the reality of multilingualism with individuals, we find that the de dominant language constellation also has enormous resonance because most of us live in and live with and have a cluster of salient languages, which might be three, four, maximum five, usually three, that are our relevant dominant language constellation. And so this is the notion. Um, these are the three books, as you can see, the one on the left, as I can see it, um, edited by Larissa Aranin and Eva Vetter, Dominant Language Constellations in Education and Language Acquisition by uh, Larissa and Sylvia melo Pfeiffer, Language Awareness and Identity, Insights from the DLC Approach, and uh, my book with uh, Larissa, Dominant Language Constellations, A New Perspective on Multilingualism. So there's a lot of literature, including many other writings that Larissa herself and other colleagues have done, and I recommend you explore those. So it's a set of languages that together carry all the functions of the human language. Um, in other words, we work with them and they share our cognitive, expressive, communi communicative load, enabling individuals and groups to persist in a multilingual environment. That We don't need to know all of them in the same way. We don't need to have the same proficiencies and uses and relationships with them, but they are active, a working part of the repertoire that we have and usually comprising three. There is a very good website for this, which I recommend uh, you look at it. I'll have it on a, a later slide. Um, and uh, as you can see there, it's the societal language contact and multilingualism, but also individual uh, multilingual practices. Uh, as Vivian Cook writes, it's one useful way of looking at multilingualism from a multi-competence perspective, or Professor Li Wei, its emphasis on dynamic and ever-changing nature of multilingualism. It's an understanding of the historic and ideological context and original and productive contribution to scholarship and knowledge. Um, now, it's treated, multilingualism is treated in problem, in policy mostly as a problem. In academic settings, most people celebrate diversity, pluralism, etc. But actually institutions do very little about it. Academics praise it, but institutions tend to ignore it. Um, in sociolinguistic and economic reality, there is enormous inequality and injustice and even violence associated with multilingualism. One of the areas I've worked in in the last 15 years have been con conflict uh, mitigation and conflict amelioration in Myanmar and Sri Lanka and the south of Thailand, where there are civil conflicts in which there's a strong language dimension. So it's not reasonable, I think, to be naive about multilingualism the way many people have been. It's not multilingualism that's causing these problems. It's the oppression of some languages within multilingual societies that's causing it. And multilingual scholars need to be aware that uh, of this and to not speak of multilingualism as this undifferentiated thing in the world, which it certainly is not. And if you'll allow me to quote myself at the bottom, I say, multilingual language abilities are not uniformly distributed across social groups and geographic areas. One of the most striking features is the sharp hierarchy in value according to, accorded to different languages, um, etc. I've got the rest of that's there for you to read. I have removed some slides from here, but one of them was going to be uh, Princess Charlotte in the U in England and the celebration of her bilingualism, um, and uh, and of course that's a wonderful thing that she's becoming bilingual. But um, this is a reality of millions of children around the world whose equally important and uh, valuable multilingualism and bilingualism is not celebrated. Um, in my own work in the 2020 paper, I extended the DLC concept uh, in discussion with Larissa to uh, Vietnam and to script. And there's this remarkable power in Larissa's idea of DLC because 
uh, when I wrote that section, I was nervous because I thought, well, maybe I haven't really understood what her idea is, but she was very enthusiastic about it and and, pra and praised what had come out of it. But basically, to kind of very long story uh, short, um, in, uh, for a long period of time, the Vietnamese state, monarchical state, functioned in classical Chinese. It was an extension of the Chinese empire. It was actually um, a, a deeply Confucian society. And the Vietnamese language was hierarchically under uh, a Chinese. Then, um, a, uh, and the kind of language in Vietnamese that people used in hierarchic forms, its written form was called Chu Han, which is written there, meaning Chinese writing. And against that, there arose a dissident way of writing called Chu Nom, meaning our form of writing, which was Vietnamese written in Chinese characters, but in a complication, a complicated way. So the characters came to have different meanings from their classical Chinese ones. And the literature that this was used for was the literature of opposition. So there was poetry and um, novels and texts of proclaiming uh, conflict and tension. Um, and these were uh, ways of developing the Vietnamese language, but also developing it against uh, what was dominant at the time. And then in, um, uh, in the early to mid 19th century, uh, Vietnam fell under French colonial rule and French became the imposed language and the uh, French um, uh, uh, educators and other people, but actually started with Jesuit priests as a form of notation. They Romanized the Vietnamese language, which if you look at a Vietnamese text today, you'll see large number of diacritics because it is a tone language like Chinese is a tone language. And in a Romanized script, the tones are marked with diacritics. Um, and there are different number of tones between the North and the South. So it's a very, very complicated system, which the Viet French were wanting to learn to be able to conduct their colonial rule in the country. And so this established a Romanized form of writing the language. So here you had, through the 19th century and early 20th century, three forms of writing the same language, writing it in classical Chinese characters, um, writing it in a dissident Vietnamese form of ch uh, classical Chinese characters, and then writing it in Romanized writing. And so we have a dominant language constellation. So quite a lot of people had this command of these three scripts inside their regular literacy functioning. So a very sophisticated script DLC. Um, so the DLC, uh, I hope you can see this clearly. The DLC is different from translanguaging, which is the popular way for people to talk about uh, complex language practices today. Um, using one's language ac assets, stressing the interconnections between languages. We're not focused on that within DLC, though, you know, it's a separate field of work. It's different from the language repertoire, which has all the languages and skills of an ind individual or community listed. So it's the totality. The dominant language constellation is different because it's the se a selected group of languages that have salience in the life of an individual or a community. Um, this will be my last slide and then I'll stop. Unfortunately, I can't take any questions uh, because you'll get this two days after I've uh, finished it and send it, but I hope it's stimulated some discussion. Working with the DLC, uh, some current projects that include a literacy focus and which reinforce what I've been saying about it, how productive it is, how useful it is how it seems to resonate with people's lived lives. I recommend that you look at the chapters in the three books of DLC that I uh, showed the covers of before, because there are lots of examples from all around the world of people who found it very productive. But in our work with my colleague, uh, Dr. Harsha Wijasekara, she and I are writing a book which is based on hundreds of classroom observations undertaken in Sri Lanka where we look at bilingual education. We use the work of Pierre Bourdieu to analyze the, the value and of different languages and how they're negotiated. And it has a strong conflict mitigation approach to it. 
mother tongue, Sinhala and Tamil and English in the dominant language constellation and of, of teachers, of students, and how thinking about it as a constellation takes a lot of pressure out of the competition across two languages. People can see that the three languages function together, enrich people's lives, and that they're a unit. So it, it has this power of shifting attention away from the competition between individual languages. And then in Tunisia, a book that's uh, much more uh, advanced. In fact, we're about to submit the manuscript this week. Um, and my uh, colleague, Dr. Fethi Helal, who's the lead author as Harsha we, is of our Sri Lankan project on language ideological debates in Tunisia. And there the languages involved are two, two clusters, basically the Arabic cluster with modern standard Arabic and Tunisian Arabic, the French cluster with European uh, high French and local forms of French, emergent English and minority Berber, Italian and Sicilian languages. So this is a cluster in which, again, we find many people, we've analysed hundreds of texts here to look at how people think of language in the context of the new nation being formed after the Arab Spring, the setbacks of the last couple of years, the initial promise that arose, and what role language could have in solving social tensions um, by talking about them as a cluster that are in the interests of the nation rather than the competitive single relationship. So I'm going to finish there. Um, I really, I thank you for your attention. I hope that's been useful. I certainly hope this uh, has worked very well as a uh, presentation. I'm going to stop now and I'm going to wish you well for the rest of the conference.